One of the most successful colonists Africa has ever known, the baboon. There's an old Zulu legend about where baboons came from. Among the tribes the Great Spirit created was the Tusini, a sad disappointment to him because they neglected their livestock and were lazy. So he decided to change them to suit their lifestyle. He made them hairy so they wouldn't have to weave blankets to stay warm because that was too boring and time consuming. They found walking on two feet tiresome, so he let them walk on their hands as well. And gave them long tails to swat flies. When they found how much they changed, they became mistrustful of humans and kept watch for them. But then, accepting their lot, continued to live peacefully in the African bush. Baboons are primates, a family of mammals that are one of the most successful, diverse and widespread of all. Humans belong to this family, which means there are primates all over the world. Baboons are the most successful of all of Africa's non-human primates and have conquered nearly every country south of the Sahara. The primate family tree has four major branches. The New World monkeys of Central and South America form one. A second contains the Old World monkeys of Asia and Africa. And this includes baboons. Prosimians, or almost monkeys, form the third branch. Madagascar's lemurs and Africa's bush babies make up the majority of prosimians. The primates of the fourth major branch are known for complex brains and large size. They are the hominoids, that's the humans and the apes, namely chimpanzees and gorillas. Most Old World African monkey species live permanently in the trees, a place that calls for good eyesight and good grip. Some prefer to spend time on the ground. Most old world monkeys have flattened faces and nearly all have long tails. Eyes which face forward and see well in color give an alert and inquisitive window on the world. Of all Old World monkeys, baboons are the largest. A big male chukma like this can reach 50 kilos. Females are generally much smaller, half or even a third of a male's weight. These remarkable size differences evolved as a result of the different demands and pressures put on each sex. When walking in the open, a male's greater size makes him a necessary and reassuring bodyguard for a mother and vulnerable baby. Baboons have longer jaws than most Old World monkeys, with sparse fur on very human-shaped ears.
three bones at the base of a baboon's tail are fused, so it has a permanent kink. More than just something that waves about at random, a tail is used for balance and body language. A tail helps when displaying tree climbing skills, like executing a neat backflip. Instead of two sets of paws, baboons have typical primate hands and feet, and elongated, nimble fingers tipped with round, flat nails. Baboon feet are quite recognizably feet with long, flexible toes, and on their hands and feet they can cover considerable distances each day. Over several million years, baboons gradually abandoned full-time life in the trees, and so they lost the amazing athleticism of many of their smaller old-world monkey cousins, who owe theirs partly to their tails. To many primates, a tail is as good as a fifth limb, something to hang by and get a grip in the shifting treetops, but not a baboon's tail. Baboons couldn't copy such skills. Like all primates, baboon mothers jealously guard young that start life as semi-naked pink faces. These darken with age, and though head and ears do look over large now, the youngster will grow into both in only a matter of weeks and lose those rubber toy looks. Baboon society is a strict hierarchy in which each knows its place. And the young quickly discover where they slot in. If mother is the dominant female, her daughters automatically join the upper echelons of society. Mother is hot on discipline. And a floppy young tail, still without a kink, is a ready-made restrainer. But for those no longer always tied to mother's apron strings, the world is a big adventure playground. These youngsters are among the newest members of a gregarious society, which may have as many as 130 individuals, if living conditions are good. Sixty-five million years ago, the downfall of the dinosaurs gave the mammals their chance. Now the world was a safer place to colonize, and one mammal the size of a large mouse quickly staked its claim. This creature was the ancestor of all primates. A solitary, nocturnal animal in those primeval days, it grubbed around for invertebrates and sap in the relative safety of the trees. Today's bush baby probably looks and behaves very like that long extinct ancestor. Still solitary and nocturnal, still about the same size, small enough to fit the palm of a hand, still with large forward-facing eyes. A tiny creature that leaves urine palm prints on branch and trunk to mark territory. and still ambushing insects, easy to locate in the dark with those big eyes and ears. When the sun rises, the bush baby hides away and sleeps, just as its early ancestors would have done. 
from the age of the dinosaurs to around 40 million years ago, many primates looked much like today's Madagascan lemurs. These creatures had become family animals and ate not just bugs and sap, but leaves. They were doing fine until monkeys turned up about 40 million years ago. This was hot competition, and only the lemurs living on Madagascar before it split away from Africa were now safe. Lemurs still flourish today on this big monkey-free island. Around 20 million years ago, Africa was warm and wet, with thick forest nearly everywhere. This was perfect for the primate family tree, and it grew bigger. The primates multiplied. New species appeared and carved out their own separate niches on the lush green continent. Fifteen million years ago, on an island in East Africa's Lake Victoria, lived a monkey called Victoria Pathicus. It may have resembled the ancestor of all Old World monkeys, and looked rather as a vervet does today. Like it, this ancestor probably lived near the ground. Today's baboons were late arrivals. They only appeared about two and a half million years ago but quickly proved resilient conquerors. It was tough to find enough food in the trees for all the monkeys, so baboons started foraging on the ground, going back to sleep in the trees at night, a pattern of life they still stick to. Because these versatile animals adapt easily, they've colonized more of Africa than other primates. Almost anywhere that has food, water, and safe shelter at night is baboon terrain. And so they live in forest, savanna, and high mountain range. In the cold heights of South Africa's Drakensberg Mountains live colonies of Chakma baboons, but up here Chakma troops are smaller than at low altitude. These animals, whose name comes from the Khoi language, are confident and talented rock climbers. No ropes or vines help them on smooth vertical surfaces, just those long, versatile fingers. Drakensberg plants are not very nutritious and can't support large numbers of animals. These baboons travel further for food than others do, relying heavily on juicy roots and bulbs, particularly in winter. The payoff for picking a challenging home is that it's virtually a predator-free zone. Only an overconfident rock climber might leave its carcass to the white-backed and rare cape vultures which patrol the mountain sky. Far down at the bottom of Africa is the Cape Peninsula, flanked by the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans. It's a spectacular area, little bigger than Greater London, and is covered with Fainbos, an extraordinary and unique collection of wild plants. It's here that Africa's most southerly baboons live, though there aren't many of them. Powerful winds spawned by the chill southern ocean make this one of the cooler parts of Africa. These chakma baboons have shaggier and thicker coats than usual. 
essential draft excluders for a blustery cape. Even the young are hairier than further north. Squeezed between two great ocean currents, a warm and a cold, this beautiful wild place owes its enormous variety of plants mostly to scarce soil nutrients. It's become a place of specialists, Specialist plants, insects, and birds. The baboons have their special side too. Because of the poor soils, Cape Feinbos plants are low in nutritional value. This poses no problem to many Cape animals, like elegant Bontobok. But Feinbos plants aren't quite enough for baboons. And they can be a bit indigestible. A few mouthfuls of kaolin clay from the granite rocks quickly settles the stomach, but does nothing to tackle inadequate nutrition. But the Cape baboons have a remedy for that. When the tide is out, they're down on the shore, finding limpets, mussels, and other small sea creatures hiding under rocks and in pools. A taste in food shared with few other primates but humans. Sea creatures are more than just a collection of extra nutrients. They also help a thirsty baboon through the long, hot, dry Cape summer. Tasty ghost crab prefer to take themselves off the menu. But some hunters have only half their mind on it. After all, a beach is somewhere to relax and mess about. And somewhere for the family. The families here are now running short of males. Cape baboons have become bold and even dangerous because they've learned to equate tourists with food handouts. Living in this tourist mecca is no longer such fun because the Cape authorities are removing the biggest and boldest troublemakers, usually the males. Thousands of kilometers away, the dense rainforests of West Africa are some of the most northerly baboon habitat. Deep in untouched rainforests in Gabon, Cameroon and the Congo lives the strangest baboon of all, the mandrill. The males are spectacularly colorful. The rainforest is generally a dark world, so the flash of a male's rump is a beacon and a hazard warning and has irresistible sex appeal. The females look washed out, but they have no need to parade. The males must wear the colors if they want to mate. One male's brilliant colors are a hazard warning because another male knows exactly what they mean. The dominant, most powerful male has the richest colors, symbols of highest rank.
and the colours have sex appeal because the females recognise that the ones who have them make the best fathers. Baboons feed quite amicably alongside many other animals, particularly in Africa's savanna regions. They eat a wide range of food, mostly plants, but other living things too if they happen across them. One baboon may fight another for a delicacy, but they usually have no quarrel with other animal species. Water hyacinths and the mud pool beneath are a great draw, and while a baboon selects leaves and tubers, sacred ibis pick hidden frogs, fish or water beetles. A hammerkop chooses frogs only. And crowned cranes go for buried grubs and worms. This eating area has a wide menu and a wide clientele. Baboons don't like dirty food, but can't always do much about water quality when they're thirsty. However, powerful stomach enzymes and bacteria can exterminate most microscopic nasties in the slime. In baboon world, the hierarchy never wavers. Superiors always go first, and low-ranking individuals must wait till they've finished. Not for a moment must a lowly troop member forget its position in society. So lower rankers spend a lot of time checking around nervously for danger and to make sure it's still okay to be there. Warthogs prefer to put the pool between them and the last drinkers of the day. A sensible precaution. Even their sharp tusks might not protect them from a gang of angry baboons. The baboons could also give the amateurs a few climbing tips. Like other young primates, Baboons learn what you can and can't eat by trying it out and by copying their elders. When someone might rush up and steal a tasty find, it's good to be ambidextrous. Nimble fingers pick and strip and remove dirt to make food fit to eat. Baboons suffer aches, pains and indigestion and must prescribe their own remedies if they can. Some are in the bark of trees, like acacias.
ants and other small creatures give a bit of protein variety to the mainly vegetarian diet. Stretchy cheek pouches can store second and third courses when there's plenty on offer. A surplus to be chewed over later in case a bigger baboon arrives and makes a show of strength. He has one arm injured by a snare, but he's still strong, so the others give the big male plenty of eating space. Just as long as their own interests aren't threatened, baboons share their territory peacefully with other monkeys. But if food is scarce, then the problems start. Vervets are much smaller than baboons and no match in a food fight. Especially if reinforcements arrive. The warlike baboons are more frightening than a possible hidden crocodile. Vervet's nil, baboons won. The lookout can confirm it. The water hole rings to the sound of a thrashing. A low-ranking baboon has offended the head of the troop. Though it looks violent, it's mostly noise and show, an effective lesson in correct behavior, which matters to a disciplined society like this. Baboon play can look violent too, but it isn't. Nor is a slap in the face what it seems. It's an invitation to play. Baboon society is an incredible web of politics and alliances. And the first lessons in weaving it start early in life, in play. The females are the majority and center of the web. Their place in society is fixed at birth and almost never changes. Males, on the other hand, live their lives in a power struggle, trying to climb the ladder to the key positions. And the little guys must always make way for the big guys, pretty much like human society, in fact. Play is not restricted to youngsters. Here, two juvenile females of equal rank go in for playful jaw clamping. Domestic dogs do exactly the same thing in play. Like so much that goes on in baboon society, play has subtle, hidden functions. It helps maintain friendships, and it reminds each individual of how important or not they are.
senior troop members are always ready to crack the whip, like this high-ranking female beating her smaller subordinate for getting something wrong. A male apparently feels the fight is still not unequal enough. He has to help out. Friends in high places are as useful to a baboon as to a human. The male who does the best job of protecting the troop is rewarded by fathering most of the young. He's the dominant male, the one the females prefer. A female baboon's rump is her sexual barometer. This Hamadreya's female from the Somali desert is ready to mate. Her swollen rump is a sign no red-blooded male can possibly miss, but she'll only allow the male near her when she's at her fertile peak. He's competed hard for rank and privilege. He'll hang on to power as long as he can, but his reign may suddenly be cut short, so he distributes his genes as liberally as possible. This is a young male, not yet sexually mature, but a tolerant female is letting him practice. Mating has no fixed season, nor has birth. At the end of a six-month pregnancy, the young are born. A baboon mother usually isolates herself with her newborn in its first days. The two must bond. It needs to know its own mother before they can rejoin the troop. But she has her work cut out. Like bees to nectar, other females are drawn irresistibly to the very young. And this one, who smacks her lips to appease, has been hooked. Sometimes a higher-ranking female actually steals another's newborn. And if she isn't lactating, it may starve to death. So a mother mustn't be caught napping. After all, her baby can't know which is friend or enemy. Mother isn't about to chance it. This weak old youngster is teething, but a thorny acacia seems a strange choice of pain relief. Already long, sensitive fingers copy mother's as she rakes the dirt for food. Thumb sucking also takes the mind off teething pains. With skillful grooming, females without older siblings or young of their own can seduce a new mother into letting them near hers. A privilege not to be shared. The rival can only sit out of arm's reach and hope her turn comes. The seductive ploy is working. The baby's mother is now relaxed. and trusting. Time to reap the rewards of the skillful finger work. Life's just a big game at an age when a youngster's all fingers and thumbs. little time for such frivolity when they're all adults. When travelling in dense forest, 
It's quicker and safer by canopy. To find roots and the freshest, most digestible leaves, West Africa's mandrills commute many kilometers each day. They are the greatest travelers of all the boons. Others, like chukmas in the southern African savanna, are simply not in the same league, yet their skills are still considerable. They learn tree climbing at mother's knee. And she's their safety net. Just a few months old, and a youngster has the confidence and skill of a pro, and each hour of play hones the skills. Most of a chukma's travelling, however, is done over open ground, where a big strong male struts in the knowledge of his high rank. Posture says it all in baboon walk. However, he still keeps an eye out for something tougher than himself, like a hungry crocodile. But the dangers he can't see, another can. A quick warning bark and no more swagger. Although his posture is proud and confident, even a dominant male checks over his shoulder for predators. Subordinates look over theirs in case they've managed to offend their superiors. A mother with helpless young has other things to think about. She's handicapped by needing to help it hang on. Young baboons are soon strong enough to glue themselves to mother's belly. This is fine as far as it goes, but a double undercarriage still makes life awkward. And spare leggings aren't much better. This is more like it. The first piggyback ride, a great leap forward in transport efficiency. Three fused tailbones make one half of a western saddle. And now for the baboon derby. Mothers and young need the protection of the dominant male, and he always leads when the troop is on the move. Together, even in the open, a big troop runs little risk of attack. If separated, then they could have problems. <laughs> Baboons communicate noisily, just what's needed in predator country where the troop always posts a male lookout. But will he see them first? An alert youngster sounds the first alarm. A quick bark and the word is out. Other animals are swift to catch on. But a guard's duties don't include looking for trouble.
this seems suicidal. But what he's doing is creating a diversion, giving the others time to run. Without backup, he'd better retreat. Up where the young mother is, well out of reach. It's perhaps silent communication that speaks loudest in baboon society. Grooming is a powerful language, and who grooms who speaks volumes. But there's more to it than just a parasite removal service. Baboons groom to bond, to win friends and allies, get places, seek favors. Females with no older siblings or young groom new mothers to be allowed access to theirs. A male who grooms a high-ranking and sexually receptive female is canvassing to be a father. And if there's a baby to make a fuss over, they score even more points, a true politician's tactic. A low-ranking male grooms the dominant male, He's busy ingratiating himself, forging a useful alliance. This female reaps the rewards of her grooming and reassures the youngster with lip smacks as it in turn gets in some early learning. The pecking order applies to grooming just like everything else. When a high-ranking male apparently feels he's not getting enough attention, he does something about it. When his superior arrives, the low-ranking male decides to find another job. The superior makes his meaning quite clear, just by standing there. His subordinates soon get the drift. They know where they stand in order of importance. On a more practical level, grooming removes unpleasant parasites and seeds and salt crystals from sweat. And it also has the benefits of a massage. The brain responds by releasing endorphins, relaxing hormones, just what's needed after a stressful day wheeling and dealing in the troop. Body language speaks volumes too. A fake mating between males is an act of dominance. The lower ranking male now grooms the other's rump to acknowledge still further his inferior status. Offering the rump with tail to one side is a gesture of appeasement and respect. To grab another's tail is a playful gesture. A young, high-ranking female stamps her foot. It shows others she's displeased and reminds them of her rank. It's not hard to know where a baboon troop is. They're noisy creatures, constantly calling to let others know where they are and what they're up to. It's just part of the troop's safety precautions. A baboon also communicates with its face, as people do. Ears pinned back, 
means welcome. But a yawn can say the opposite. A big male usually bears his canines to threaten or warn, and his are longer than a lion. Of course, a yawn can always just mean you're sleepy. On any average day, savanna baboons cross paths with many other animals, especially at the waterhole. Though most of their liquids come from food, they do need to join the others for a drink. A baboon can be aggressive, but not usually towards animals with whom they operate a mutual alarm system. If any one of the drinkers saw or imagined danger, the message would quickly go round. Hippos are rarely a threat, but crocodiles are another matter. They need a wide berth. They're only one of a baboon's enemies, here to eat, not drink. Lions are an even bigger enemy, especially at sundown when they move into action and will seize any meal they can. Time to grab the young and run. Loud calls are intended to confuse the lioness so she can't pick a victim. But one mother didn't act in time. There's always one baboon sentry posted at a waterhole to try and stop that happening and let the others relax. Surprisingly, baboons are capable of altruism. This patas monkey in Ghana became lost when it was tiny and was adopted by a troop of guinea baboons. Now it's one of them, playing, eating and grooming along with the family. Outside the human world, altruism is almost unheard of, but obviously these primates possess what's usually seen as a uniquely human virtue. Baboon society echoes human society in many other ways. Socially advanced and sophisticated, adaptable and versatile, devoted to their young, fearless in defense of the group. All of them characteristics shared with their hairless relatives, the humans. I 